Hello, good afternoon. You're watching Media Live from the News Hub. I am Portia Gabo. Coming up this afternoon. National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, says six people killed in Sunday's three-hour-long dump war. Minister of State in charge of tertiary education in Ghana dismisses reports there is a new public universities bill seeking to concentrate power in the hands of government in Rwandan public universities. Coming up in business this afternoon, Bank of Ghana to raise 7 billion CDs from government to support distressed savings and loans companies and other finance houses. In international news, Nigerian authorities offering free family planning methods and advice to families in an effort to slow population growth. We first begin with education and the Minister of State in charge of tertiary education in Ghana, Professor Kwesi Yanka, has dismissed reports there is a new public universities bill which is seeking to concentrate power in the hands of government in running public universities. And speaking on TV3's current affairs program captured by women, Professor Yanka said what currently exists and is being reported in the media as a bill is only a preparatory document that has gotten into wrong hands. People are talking about a public universities bill. I'm not sure there's one already in existence that people should worry or be happy about. But there's one in preparation at the moment, um, which is at its very, at the earliest stages of preparation. Um, incidentally, the impression has been given that uh, there's a public universities bill in existence and which ought to be subjected to debate and discussion. This, uh, which is a little worrying because listening into debates and discussions about um, the public universities bill or bill to be or bill in preparation, there have been so many presumptions and highly erroneous impressions uh, that have been uh, created. I am a little uncomfortable with a situation where the normal processes uh, through which we within the ministry channel new ideas and bills coming up. Let me say that as far as the ministries are concerned, the Ministry of Education in particular, we have our own stakeholders, if it's tertiary education, Key stakeholders are the universities themselves. Key stakeholders are functionaries in the university, vice chancellors themselves. We normally canvass ideas in preparation uh, through the vice chancellors and through officials of the university. They are very key because they are going to activate and implement the policies on our behalf. And what does the government gain in not consulting them? But start rolling out the policies or taking the policies to parliament for debate. That the memo, the internal memo, haven't been leaked to the social media. Whereas at this stage of the preparation, the memo is insulated. It is an internal affair. You finish all your discussions and consultations and so on and so forth. Um, and, and thereafter, then you put it in the public domain. Let's now deal with flooding in Accra and the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, says six people have been confirmed dead following the three-hour-long downpour on Sunday. According to NADMO, four of the bodies were retrieved at Ajay Kojo in Ashaman and another one at Odorna. Two persons are still missing, according to NADMO. The Ghana Meteo Agency had issued an alert indicating that a rainstorm at the southern portions of Togo is forecast to affect places in the southern half of 
the country. The rainstorm, according to the agency, affected areas such as Betoy, Akachi, Hotbando, Anet, and Varons in the Volta region. A similar incident last week left five people dead in Accra. In the studio with me is Alfred Kwesio Puku. He is the president of the Ghana Institute of Planners and has been involved in efforts to tackle floods in the country. Thanks so much for joining us, sir. Thank you. So the issue of flooding is a perennial problem. Several attempts have been made to curb this. What really is the problem and can we really curb this? Thank you very much. Um, I'm at a loss as to where to start because this is a repeated story every year, predictable evening, and um, it appears that there is still eluding us a solution to that. It has three arms in dealing with the flooding in Accra. There's a planning aspect, and there's implementation aspect, and there's a management aspect. If in terms of planning, designing, uh, the flood areas, getting the proper drains with engineers and planners, getting on paper done. Uh, I can tell you that uh, much has been done, that if all things were to go the way it should, meaning that you cannot control amount of rain that you fall in every year. As God, I mean, it's a natural mm -hmm. thing. But you are prepared sufficiently that at a certain minimum, at a certain level, the floods will go, no matter how much it comes, so that you reduce the risk. And so all that kind of thing in terms of paperwork, I can assure you, sufficient has been done. The next thing is implementation. If we need a drain from Achimata to Kolobo uh, to expand the, um, the dump of the Odor River, um, how much money do you need? And can you do all that in a year? And are you going to cover the drains and so on? That left, is left with money to implement. Has the government been able to do it at a stretch? Mm. And if not, in what pieces has it been done? And uh, what can that be done next? So from there, it has moved from the desk of the planner and the engineers to financing to implementation of the particular project. Then the next thing is that even if it has been done and covered or whatever it is, it's level with the management. How do people around the drain manage it such that the amount of water or storm drain that will get into the drain would be able to flow out. And that is where currently Ghana and Accra in particular has the biggest of the problem. Last week I was with the Natmo people and they told me that there's an underground drain at Kaneshi where a lot of water must be flowing into it from upstream. The drain is dry and empty but upstream is choked and flooding because the water that are supposed to come through and get down to the sea is not coming, mm. upstream is choked. So the biggest thing with the flood in Accra is man-made. That is, attitude of the people in treating even the minimum drain that the government has been able to do. If that is not changed, in the three arms of the, man, uh, the flooding, we will never get anywhere. You will plan, somebody implement, other in bits mm. or pieces, but the management is the best, I mean, the, the, the most poor aspect of the whole thing. If this is man-made, how do we deal with it? What, what we must deal with it, as of now, there are about three things that are being done. Uh, master plans are being prepared, um, conferences are being attended, and then workshops are being run, and then education. I have said that the issue about the conferences and the master mm -hmm. plans are all academic. Because those who go there are those who read English and write English and speak very good English. They do not stay around the, the flooding areas. So they have read and are imagining the impact and the danger that comes around. So they speak and get away with it. Those who are sitting there and staying by the flooded areas, who would not imagine the impact but feel it, that must come and show their difficulties are not part of the, um, what they call the, the conferences. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that um, I have advocated that the money that is being used to run some of the conferences, the budget, let's take some of the budget, gather the people around the drain, and let them know the impact and why is it coming every year. This year we are quite unlucky, and probably that is the beginning of our luck. The rain started in March, we are in April, 
and if it continue again in May and June, as have been previously been happening, then means that people are going to take it serious that we are no longer climatically advantaged. Formerly, if we manage May and June until next year, you are free. Mm. But now we are adding March and April to May and June. Let me hope it continues with July so that we get five months of rain and flooding. Then when you begin to talk to people about moving away and taking care, managing the drains that have been made, will be made better. All right. Right. I'll let you hold on here. Right. I have on the telephone line George AEC. He is the communications director of NADMO. Thanks so much for joining us. So sex debt, has the number changed or it's still the same? Well, can you come again, Portia? I'll say six people have been confirmed dead. Has the number changed? No, it's all six as of now and two missing. Okay. And currently, what is NADMO going to do, especially as your boss is saying in Parliament that you do not have enough items for distressed people? Oh, okay. Uh, we, we, the lot of will have where we have people that are distressed, uh, the victims, we are going to take them to them. And if we need to uh, activate the emergency or the contingency uh, bell to get uh, the interior minister, uh, to get the finance minister to release something for us to procure more. And the whole of Accra ran on the government and asked him to stop and add a um, human face to that. We have several examples to that. And so it's becoming a, a, a challenge for the government of the day any time to go ahead and do that. But as of now, something is being done, um, two things. For example, since 2015, when we had the worst of the flooding, um, the government approached the World Bank and then uh, what we call uh, a study was done. And uh, as of now, a project is beginning. In fact, it has begun. They call it Garrett. A greater Accra resilience integrated project, uh, project, development project. In that one, the whole strike from Achimota to the um, Kolobu area um, on the Dorifa and its tributaries are going to be dredged once and straight away. It's not like previously where an assembly would do its portion and the following, the contiguous assembly would not do anything. Now we're going to get a, a downstream thing. This project is being handled by, by four ministries. Uh, Minister of Works and Housing, which do the, uh, the, the, drain, the drainage work. And then the uh, Minister of Water and Sanitation, uh, Sanitation Water Resources, mm -hmm. will be dealing with the uh, garbage that people throw into the uh, stream so that the streams and uh, the drains are no more going to be a conveyor mm -hmm. for domestic waste. They will educate them, they will train them, they will give them the equipment that is required. Then the Ministry of uh, Zongo and Inner City yeah. Development are also part of the four member ministries who will be uh, educating the, um, what do you call, the vulnerable communities along the river. And then there's the fourth one, the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. They would be handling the assemblies and giving the capacity required. Apart from this, uh, NDPC, National Rural yeah. Planning Commission, of which I'm a commissioner there, is also uh, implementing what we call the SDGs, uh, mm. Sustainable mm. Development Goals, with the Ministry of Planning, where they are, uh, the SDGs has 17 goals, and 10 of them have about 24 target points that deals with disaster risk reduction. When all these are implemented, include flooding and mm. earthquake and all such things that are uh, not helpful to man, man's living. When these things are being done, then it means that we are also tackling this. Apart from that, NDPC has taxed all assemblies to prepare a disaster risk uh, reduction plan. Mm -hmm. So that collectively, we, we are going to have a national plan, even if NADMO and all the agencies have already established are not ready in terms of preparation. Assemblies by themselves will be able to mm. manage something to help that so yeah. that there could be a reduction in the flood. Thank you very much for yeah. your time. I've been speaking to Alfred Kwesiopoku. He is the president of the Ghana Institute of Planners. He's still watching Middle Life from the News Hub. Let's continue with the rest of our stories. And commuting and access to health facilities in Krachit, Bandai, Wulensi and Natayili is now easier as the bad roads have been tarred. Government released funds for the reconstruction of the Krachit, Bandai, Wulensi road after TV3's mission constant report on the bad state of the major road. This is the routine form of commuting in Pandai. Access to healthcare in this area 
remains a major challenge due to the nature of roads. Not all health workers would wish to work in these areas, especially at community-based health planning and services, chiefs facilities in hinterland communities. Those posted there are doing their best to save lives in the midst of limited resources and logistics. In communities where there are no means of transportation, outreach programs are not a priority and the consequences are dire. Roads here are deadly and increase traveling hours. Pandai is the hub for yams, but most farmers lost interest in farming as there are no good roads to cut farm produce for sale. Three months after a mission report on the plight endured by commuters on the stretch, government released funds for the construction of the road linking Ketekrachi through Pandai Willensee to join the Eastern Corridor Road at Binda Junction. The contract for the 75-kilometer road was awarded in 2016, but work did not commence due to lack of funds. Contractors First Sky Limited and Jianzi Nonferous Construction Limited moved to site and brisk work has been done. The people of Banda Bandai, Wilensi, Nakpayili and Binda are using a third road for the first time in more than four decades. What this means is that traveling hours have been shortened and access to healthcare also not much a problem. The Chinese firm Jianzi Nonferous Construction Limited has completed the application of second coat on its portion of the road, while First Sky Limited is yet to complete its portion. Resident engineer at the Ghana Highways Authority, Engineer Solomon Ej, gave more details about the project. What happened was that uh, the contractor started most of his uh, concrete works, but the earthworks delayed due to financial constraints on the contractor. Both contractors are to complete their projects within a period of 36 months. Commuters are happy. For those born in Pandai and have never moved out of the district, this would be their first time seeing and using a third road because there is none anywhere in the district. Member of Parliament for Pandai, Matthew Nyendam, who is happy about the progress of work, never kept mute. The town roads itself are almost done because it's just left with some few portions to be awarded. And like you rightly said, from Pandai towards Banda, that's the Vota region, or you can call it the new OT region, the roads are almost done. If you move from Bandai to Binda, that is the Bimbla Wolensi Road, it's almost done. And last week, the Minister for Roads and Highways has approved the Salaga Bandai Road. That is going to be awarded. I will not be surprised if next week that project is advertised to make sure that that road is also constructed. District Chief Executive for Bandai, Emmanuel Ata Tatablata, is hopeful. Government would pay attention to other bad roads in the district. More resources would be required to address the issues bordering bad roads, improve healthcare accessibility, as well as improve the socio-economic lives of the people in Pandai and its surrounding districts. Stanley Nibleu, TV3 News, Pandai, Northern Region. Indeed, TV3 Mission gets results. Coming up as the MTN video report. And today, our citizen journalist Joseph Tenyaku reports on the poor state of the Akotoklu Gua Primary School in the Upper Manyokoba district of the Eastern Region. Akotoklu Gua ROC Primary School, a school in the Upper Manyokoba district in the Eastern Region. This is the situation. You can also send your video reports via WhatsApp on 055-143-3044. You're still watching Media Life from the News Hub. We'll have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us.
In business this afternoon, after cleaning up the banking sector, the Bank of Ghana is now set to raise 7 billion CDs from government to support the stressed savings and loans companies and other finance houses. Governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Ernest Addison, at the ongoing spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank Group in Washington, D.C., said liabilities of the savings and loans and other finance houses were estimated at 7 billion CDs. Although Dr. Ennis Addison did not say when the cleanup exercise of the savings and loans companies would begin, it is expected that the process will begin before the end of the year. It is, however, unclear which module the central bank will adopt, either a purchase and assumption agreement by which strong savings and loans companies will take up selected assets and liabilities of the insolvent ones or consolidation of all the insolvent ones into a new savings and loans entity. The module to adopt, according to Dr. Addison, was part of the ongoing discussions between the central bank and the Minister of Finance to iron out the best module to save the sector that was almost in distress. It spent almost 12 billion guarantees last year to liquidate seven distressed banks and the cost of cleaning up the savings and loans companies and other finance houses were becoming a burden to the government. Dr. Ernest Addison said, government would have to bear the initial cost of the cleanup exercise and later recover its liabilities from the assets of the companies. Only eight out of the 37 companies are operating in the savings and loan sector have paid up capital above the minimum amount of 15 million Ghana cities. The savings and loans and finance houses subsector dominates the specialized deposit taking institution sector in Ghana, accounting for 42% of the total asset size of the subsector. Let's now go to the Ashanti region where rampant cuts of telecommunication cables during road construction have resulted in costly disruptions to telecom services and inconveniences to subscribers in the region. Now, telecom operators are seeking efficient collaboration with managers of road infrastructure to improve the situation. The National Communications Authority and the Telecoms Chamber have expressed concern about the increasing speed of telecom cable cuts with its dire implications for subscribers. Majority of the cuts occur during road construction. Officials of the Ghana Highways Authority, the Urban and Feeder Roads Department have been engaging interest groups in telecoms sector to address challenges. Issues of interest include relocation of telecoms cables during road construction and incorporating telecoms infrastructure at the inception stage of future road projects. Some of the telecoms operators are worried about the cost incurred when cables are cut. It costs us a lot and we normally lose our cherished customers. As I'm talking to you now, I have lost about 1,000 fixed customers and about 400 fixed customers around Dabine and then Atasumaso and Santase due to this road construction. Our concern mainly has been the engagement with the contractors who work on these rules, at least getting us informed in good time that they are going to do so, so, and so. Then we, in turn, will be on time to relocate our cables before they start damaging them. We have a license to put, it, to put the fiber um, in places where we've been directed to, but they still go ahead and cut these fires. So you would have a, uh, a, a network challenge and blame it on MTN to say to us that we, we do not, uh, our network has issues. The Ashanti Regional Director of the Ghana Highways Authority, Engineer Christian T said the authorities routine monitoring exercise are to ensure customers are provided with excellent service in the region. We have agreed that we are going to meet periodically and share information as to impending projects and also what we expect from them, what they are also expecting from us, so that we'll be able to work together to ensure that we don't waste taxpayers' uh, money. Ghana has commenced the construction of a fiber optic project on the Eastern Corridor to intensify investments in mobile broadband infrastructure and improve quality of service. 
Let's now speak to the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Telecommunications Chamber, Ken Ashibe. Thanks so much for joining us. So how widespread is the situation of fiber cuts in the country? Well, it's really very widespread and it's very disturbing. If you look at the data, uh, last year we jumped from under 200 fiber cuts uh, per month mm. to 263 was what we ended with just our members. And unfortunately, in uh, January this year, we have well, we've gone high above that. And looking at the quarter three numbers, we're doing now 350 plus uh, fiber cuts. And it is you know, the major cost of this is from grain construction, road construction, and then you also have private developers also uh, being corporate. Then you have um, uh, the other utilities like electricity, uh, Ghana water also causing it. You have challenges uh, when you have uh, clearing being done as well. The aerial fiber also gets uh, uh, cut as well. So it's really a widespread phenomenon and it's the reason for a lot of the interruption in, uh, in services because once you lose uh, a fiber as cut, a, a typical example is what happened to MTN very recently where it had about five multiple cuts, you know, at once, which resulted in the, virtually the whole of the northern part of Ghana being cut off. You have to reroute your traffic to, you might have to use um, microwave links, and then it also causes, when you do the rerouting, congestion on the existing uh, networks that have not been cut. And all of that will result in challenges in voice communication, in data communication, and even uh, mobile financial services as well. Well, fortunately for us, we started some engagements with the regulator, the NTA. Uh, we're forming a committee to look, uh, work with it. Uh, in the promulgation of the law on cybersecurity, uh, there's moved to make uh, telecommunication infrastructure critical national infrastructure, which will then make the punishment for uh, damaging it also as you do for any critical national infrastructure. Also, we, there's been an establishment of the National Engineering Coordinating Team, which is made up of all the road uh, uh, agencies, uh, Ghana Highways, um, and then the Department of Urban Roads, and then the utilities and various regulators. And that is supposed to ensure that there's a lot of coordination amongst all of us within the space. Uh, we are also we're happy that we are having this conversation so that we can do a lot of education. Unfortunately, like when it comes to fiber, unlike electricity where people know that when they cut it, it might result in you know, injury and death today themselves, or water where they know that it would result also in uh, you know, the, the whole place being wet. Fiber is low voltage, so really uh, the, very, the damage to people are very little. But what happens is that when these cables are laid, there are cable markers, there is sun, a sun bed, there are also warning tapes. That should signal to anybody that, you know, where you are excavating, there's something underneath. Mm -hmm. So we also need to continue this engagement in terms of education of everybody to realize that when we cut fiber, it affects all of us because now telecommunication is virtually a critical utility that all of us need for critical things that we do. So beyond this engagement, and very, uh, just tomorrow, uh, we'll be having a meeting with uh, Ghana Water to discuss our collaborations to ensure that there's no interruption coming from there. The Ministry of Roads and Highways is also calling a meeting between us and a, a few of the contractors who are very recalcitrant. So we're hoping that these engagements will continue. But yeah. beyond all of that, if we keep on getting what we're doing and after all the communication and all the education, we definitely will start with some legal suits. Uh, definitely some civil suits will happen. And then we're also pushing for the weekend courts that currently handle uh, copper tests to also expand its mandate to add fiber so that we can bring criminal actions against those who recklessly and negligently destroy telecommunication infrastructure. Right. You know, because at the end of the day, it affects all of us as a country.
Thank you very much for your time. And Ken Ashide is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Telecommunications Chamber. You're still watching Media Life from the News Hub. In other news, internal auditors have been partly blamed for financial malfeasance in the annual Auditor General's report. And Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament, Dr. James Kluche Averji, insisted compromises on the part of internal auditors allows heads of state institutions to violate laid down regulatory measures. A worrying development in Ghana and Africa is the growing cases of corruption. Even though a widespread social canker, major culprits in the corruption cases are often persons trusted with the authority to manage the affairs of the state. Each year, the Auditor General identifies financial malfeasance in its annual report to Parliament. Addressing the 2019 Annual National Internal Audit and Governance Conference in Accra, Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament and MP for K2 North, Dr. James Kluchia Veji, expressed dismay over the role of internal auditors in the various institutions. A person left the organization, but he continued to receive salary. Is the internal auditor not checking the payroll to ensure that people who are paid by the organization are actually working? So we think that if the internal auditor is doing the right thing, certain things that are noted by the Auditor General will definitely not occur. A former Auditor General and Chair for the Ghana Audit Service Board, Professor Edward Dreajiman, lamented over the failure of the Internal Audit Agency to function effectively. The agency's performance has been disappointing. It has not been able to perform the functions for which it was set up. I'm not sure we can confidently say that the internal audit agency has achieved its purpose. There is the need to restructure and reposition the internal audit agency to enable it to play its essential role in the management of public finance. Guest of Honor and Minister for Sanitation, Water Resources, Cecilia Abinadapa, admonished boards of state institutions to uphold the truth and honesty in order to protect the state purse. Risk occurrence is mitigated by putting in place compliance measures, and this is where government expects the accountancy and internal audit professions to play key roles. The Institute of Internal Auditors Ghana is a professional association dedicated to the promotion and development of the practice of internal auditing in Ghana. President of the Institute, Juliet Abwajiriafe, lamented the salary disparity between the internal auditors and other chartered accountants certificate holders. I'm a chartered accountant by profession, but I'm working as an internal auditor. But my colleague, a chartered accountant who is working as a finance person, earns more than me. Meanwhile, we have the same qualification. So that is one of the challenges we internal auditors are facing. As we speak, most internal auditors are moving to finance, and it's a big challenge for us. The 2019 conference was on the theme, Aligning Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance for Institutional Impact. And as it's for business news, let's now continue with the rest of our stories. And the Wright brothers changed the world with the invention of the aeroplane, which opened the world for aviation to begin and advance. Inspired by this feat, two brothers in Ghana, Isaac Otu and Jacob Labi, have built a light aircraft using local materials. My name is Isaac Otu. And I am Jacob Labi. We, we are two brothers. brothers. And I am Dora Dakwa. We, we are, are with Isaac Aviation. At a young age, Jacob and Isaac knew they were destined for greatness. At age eight, they manufactured their own car. Then, they decided to fulfill their long-standing dream of building an aircraft. In order to achieve this, they told me they started small in the backyard of their residence at Dom Pillar 2, and they used local materials such as iron square pipes, plywood and aluminum sheets to construct the light aircraft. We thank you, Jehovah Almighty. Today, the brothers who are junior high school leavers are here for a test run of the light aircraft at an airfield at Afenia in the Greater Accra region. Dora Dakwa is also here to learn from the brothers.
Before the test run begins, they first need to check if everything is in order. Then a battery is brought in to kickstart the engine. Contact. 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 Moving of ailerons. Check it again, yeah, the rudder, and then the nose wheel, yes, yes. And off goes Goffy 1601. Goffy 1601 can carry two people with a maximum weight of 757 kilograms. The wings are detachable for easy transportation. The engine, which runs on petrol, is a used Volkswagen engine which produces power to drive the propeller. I'm just coming off the Golf B1601, a light aircraft manufactured by two brothers here in Ghana. And they tell me they need financial support as well as a license to become like the Wright brothers, that's the forefathers in the aviation industry. The Ghana Civil Aviation has already given us the opportunity for this runway for testing the aircraft. The name of the aircraft is Goffy. 1601. My name is Isaac. That's why the plane is God has favored Isaac. It's a gift from God. So if I stand up and say I will do something, I just started and doing it. We can use this aircraft for police to patrol around and also for our hospitals to also spray as a mosquito insecticide and also for farming to sprinkle the water to uh, uh, their farmings. We can also build as a cargo aircraft that can load things from a place to another place. Also for small, small medical things also, we can also use this aircraft to also do it, yeah. Jacob and Isaac told me they were able to construct the light aircraft through the assistance of an Air Force officer and by watching videos on YouTube. Although the aircraft can fly, they currently do not have the license to do so due to some challenges. Please, you see this one? This is called joystick. 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 Yeah. Dora Dakwa is understudying the brothers. She wants to become a pilot. In fact, I met one of the brothers and I, I admired their talent and decided to join. They have that God-given talent to build aircraft and when given the supports, they can build in large quantities. So I'm appealing to the government and the general public to come to the aid of these brothers. They are set to transform the aviation industry in Ghana. What the brothers need now is financial support. We are not having a license, so uh, the, the, the law is not giving us permit to fly. So we need a license, and then the license also costs a lot. So we need a support from everyone, from the government, from individual, everyone. We need a support to do the insurance and, and, and to cover the aircraft al al along the line whilst we are doing the taxing test and then the flying test. We will also teach uh, 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 the, the youth so that uh, Ghana or Africa, we will become one best of uh, aircraft model and also uh, 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 in terms of piloting. They are hopeful someday, somehow, Goffey 1601 will fly in the skies. Porsche Gabo, TV3 News, Afinia. Visit my other flagstaff house, and he, he, he nodded, he agreed. So I went to him for a handshake, and he got up to shake my hands. You know. <laughs> the, the president <laughs> shook my he got up to shake my hands. It was, so it was, a, it was an informal agreement yeah. that you know he would be ready to host me. And, and, and to be frank, I'm very um, humbled and also big up to all the media houses who are showing tremendous support. It tells how much the media takes comedy seriously in this country. What will you discuss with him? Hmm, what will I discuss with him is how the government can help make comedy better. Mm -hmm. Now, in that sense, you know, um, comedy as an art, you need to perform to people. And the means to bring the people 
the infrastructure, you know, the 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 ease to getting um, venues and etc. Yeah. You know, the government can help intervene, and also um, the government has some media outlets. You know, basically our aim is to take the comedy to other regions because we get people complaining a lot mm -hmm. that you guys are all focused on Accra, yeah. and you know, leaving Accra to go organize an event in another region is a whole lot of work. But at least if the government is involved, there's a few uh, leeways that oh, okay. These guys help them get secure this and this and that venue outside Accra. It will make it beautiful for comedy to reach other people because I think they were doing it for Ghana. Mm -hmm. So, what I'll ask him is an enabling environment. Any means possible, his, his government can help mm -hmm. us. You, know. you, you also want to take comedy to the next level. How do you intend to achieve this? Because many people are of the view Ghanaian comedians aren't funny. Is that the case? Um, that is. Uh, a very depressing propaganda that was pushed against us. It was a bunch of people who did that to favor their investment in foreign comedy. Mm. And I think it's a very sad thing, if you ask me, because mm. you don't destroy your own to accept somebody's own. At the end of the day, you have no heroes. You understand? So it was a deliberate propaganda. But it's also beautiful that we've had some Ghanaians who are beyond propaganda, who decided that, let's see what these guys are doing. And when they drew close, um, which is patronizing our event, they stuck with us. And we have a lot more people. I have a monthly comedy show called Comedy Express, which talks about 150 to 200 people. Every month, the place is full. The next show is May 4th. So um, taking it to the next level is that you know, we, want to, we want to get to a, a point where it will be easy for a comedian to secure visa. It will be easy for um, the traveling details of a comedian to come up easy. It will be easy for a, com a comedian to do official documentation much easier. So that's the next level is um, making it, you know, well recognized right. and also uh, give it a little push. All right. you Thank you very much for your time, DK. Thank you we so have much. More on this and other stories on News 360 coming up as international news. With Nigeria's population growing at more than 3% a year, Nigerian authorities are offering free family planning methods and advice to Nigerian families in an effort to slow population growth. It can be difficult to provide for a large family. Nigeria has the largest population in Africa and it's growing at 3.2% a year. The U.S. Census Bureau says at that rate, there will be an estimated 402 million people in Nigeria in 2050. And that's it for Midday Live. Thanks so much for watching. I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon.